Hi everyone, I'm Jesse at Stropro.com and today I'm going to be showing you the brand new Godox X-Pro version 2. This is brand new for 2023 and the X-Pro version 1 has been around for a number of years and this is the upgrade to that controller. There's a number of new features in here and we're going to take a look at all of them. We're also going to just go through quickly and see which controller you should purchase. There's the X2, the original X-Pro, and now the X-Pro version 2. So which one do you get? Let's take a closer look and answer those questions right now. So it can be a little bit confusing trying to choose which trigger to purchase. Uh, there's a number of different ones and you might already have one or you might just be starting out. So let's just go over a couple of the differences and try to decide which one you should pick up. So this is the X-Pro version 1 here, and this has been around for a number of years, going on close to six years, I believe it is now. And this was a great controller, um, really revolutionized the whole Godox system, having individual groups that we could select and everything from the top. And a lot of the best features of this are transferring over into the new version. Now, I do want to mention that when I talk about the new version, the X-Pro version 2, Adorama, a company out of the US, has their own version. It's called the R2 Mark II. This is not the same controller, so please don't get confused. That's an Adorama exclusive where they've just changed some buttons. It is not the latest version with all the latest technology, so just be aware of that. You want the Godox X-Pro version two. So with that out of the way, uh, the X-Pro version one is going to be discontinued, so it will be around for probably six more months, but after that, it is going to go away and we are going to be left with two controllers. So those two controllers are the X2, or the X2T, I should say, and then obviously the one we're gonna be talking about more in depth, the X-Pro version two. So which one should you choose between those two? Well, it really depends. There's number one factor is probably going to be price. The X2T is going to be significantly less expensive than the X-Pro version 2. But the bigger reason is going to be just the orientation of it. So this gives you the ability to have a hot shoe mounted accessory put on the top at the same time. So we can mount the trigger to our camera and then we can also have a speed light on the top. If you had old studio strobes or something, or a microphone, whatever you wanted, that could all mount right on the top here. And this is TTL pass-through, so it will pass the information from your speed light if you were using TTL right through the controller into the camera, which can be really nice if you're an event shooter, a wedding shooter, and you are using that flash on top. Now, in contrast to that, we have the X-Pro version two, which just has the big screen on the top. And that's really the difference that you're getting here, is if you want that big display versus a smaller display, then there's your difference, really. Both of these have most of the same technology in them now, so big things being Bluetooth, they both have now, whereas the old X-Pro didn't have that. They have channel scan, which is a really nice feature. And then there's a couple differences between them, which we'll go through uh, just in the custom functions, things such as a TCM, which allows you to convert uh, TTL power to manual. So it's a couple of little niche things like that. But if you're just deciding uh, between these two, I would say if you wanna stack something on that or you wanna save some money, then go with the X2T. If you want the latest and greatest that Godox has to offer, then the X-Pro is packed with all of those features. So that's really uh, the decision between the two, but let's take a closer look now at what the X-Pro version two has to offer. So Godox has upped the box game. Let's take a look at it here. Thank you Godox for making an inexpensive box that we don't really need. But anyway, let's slide that cover off. And then we have like a jewelry case type box here where the lid just pops off and it's a very solid box. Foam fitted now, so the controller is just right in there. And if you take out all these little pieces here, we've got our little gel packet and then we have our manual which literally I can't read because it's so small so we're going to go over absolutely everything so you don't need to worry about that but that's everything that's in the box. Let's take a look at some of the physical differences between version 1 and version 2. 
So right off the bat, the screen size is actually the same. What you're gonna notice physically on this one is that the version two is a little bit wider on this side. So you can see it kind of flares out compared to this one, which is equal on both sides. So if I kind of compare them end to end, physical side is the same, just again, a little bit wider. Now on the back, they've kind of streamlined that little notch as well, whereas this one is uniform on both sides. Uh, it is a different kind of zigzag pattern on the back. Uh, showing that, you're gonna see the lock right away, and we've gone from turn style lock, which could be annoying uh, because one mounted to the camera, you're trying to get your fingers in there, and it was frustrating for people. And now we've just gone to the Canon type style uh, flip lock. So you'll find this on a lot of Canon Speedlights and actually on almost all the new Godox uh, product. This will be on there. So left is open, flip it to the right, it closes, it locks down. So really easy to take on and off. So right there, that's enough to upgrade for some people. Um, Really the buttons are very similar. So we still have our groups and stuff up the side, which we'll take a closer look. Um, we have our four control buttons along here. And then we still have our dial and a couple of mode and menu buttons on the bottom. Uh, one of the big things that they've changed, this is now USB uh, type C on here for firmware upgrades, which is nice. Um, so we've gone from this port, which everyone hated as well. It was this little plastic, or I should say rubber piece in here that opened up and you had the port and the PC sync in there. And then this rubber was always kind of annoying to get back in. A lot of people would accidentally rip that off. So Godox listened to the feedback and now we just have an open port right here for the firmware connection. And we actually have our, uh, PC sync port right beside it. And that's a 2.5 millimeter PC sync if you need to plug into it. Other than that, the battery compartment on the back is a little bit different as well. It has this little recessed button. So you still just push down and slide it out. It still uses two AA batteries. So you can use rechargeables or just regular alkalines. And one of the other things, which was kind of annoying on some of the later versions of the X-Pro, They've switched the serial number actually. So now we just have this little QR code. That's not going to a website or anything. That is literally just the serial number. Previously, they had like this huge barcode on the side, which was ugly and got worn down. So please don't take that off. That will void your warranty. If it shows back up for repair and it's missing the serial number, then the only way we can check it is to go internally, which is a big deal. So please keep that on there. Uh, other than that, not a lot uh, changed, retains basically the same shape, but a couple of those new uh, physical features, uh, you do have your Bluetooth little symbol up there and just the Godox on the front. And that's about it. Before we get into the actual menus on the controller, let's install our batteries. And as I mentioned before, this battery cover just slides out. So you can see the little ribbed area there, just push it down a little bit to release the lock and it slides forward. Now I'm using Enerloop rechargeable batteries. You can use rechargeables in this, but there is a caveat to that. Um, when you use rechargeables, the voltage is different than alkaline. So a lot of the times you're gonna get a false reading on the actual battery display on the controller. It was an issue with the version one and it's still an issue with all of the controllers. Um, that voltage just causes it not to read correctly on rechargeables. So a lot of the time it'll just blink that it's empty, but you've got hours and hours left. If that's an issue for you and you don't want to deal with that, you can just use regular alkaline batteries and that will actually show the proper battery. Um, so to install these really easy, just pop them in there, make sure you're going the right way. And then your cover, just slide it back and it clicks in there. Now, another thing I want to show you before we get going is just how this lock works. So the whole point of this lock is to make it easy and what it does when we go back and forth, this is actually raising and lowering. So there's actually a locking pin on there that it raises and lowers as well. And previously the wheel would just do that, you would turn it up. So sometimes it's actually easy to forget that you have this the other way. 
and it's not going to go into the hot shoe very easily and you can quickly damage it. So you always need to make sure that this is over on the left hand side. That's the retracted position. And all we're doing there, make sure that button is on the left, go to the hot shoe and it should slide in easily. Some hot shoe mounts are a little bit more sticky. So Sony, for example, they're notorious for having bad hot shoe connections. So it might be a little bit more difficult to put that in there. But once it's seated all the way in, just push the gray button again, slide it back the other way, and you can actually see that it retracts down and locks into place. To pull it off, just make sure you're not gonna you know, rip it from there. You need to go loosen that off again and slide it back out. So those are just a couple pointers about the locking mechanism on your X-Pro2. On the side, we have our power switch, which is this one, and then we have our focus assist beam. So when I enable that, what this is going to do is help me focus in low light. So underneath here, there's a little red kind of sensor that you can see. That's going to project a beam out to help me focus. So let's turn the lights off and give that a shot. Okay guys, so I have the controller mounted up top and this needs to be on a camera to work. But if I try to focus here, you can see that that just projected that pattern. So I'm on a blank wall, so it's really trying to pick up focus here, which is difficult. But that's what it does. It just makes it a lot easier to grab focus there. So if you don't want that enabled, if you're at a wedding or something, you don't want it projecting on someone's face, then just make sure you flip that switch off on the side. Okay guys, we've set up the controller on a stand here and we are going to go through absolutely everything for you. So if you're brand new to remote controls for strobes, then this is a great thing to watch. If you've been using them for a while, then you might just want to pick out some of the new features that we go over. So first thing we're going to do is go over here to the side and slide the power switch on. And just to let you know already, I've already turned this backlight to stay on and I've turned sleep off. So this is in default. So other than that, you're gonna turn it on. It's going to look like this for you. So it defaults right to channel 21 and we have group A highlighted. So what we have to do first is we have to set a channel and a group. So I suggest picking something other than the default um, because everyone else is going to have channel 21 on by default so you might want to change it to something else and this is done a little bit differently it's done in the menu so we're going to go over here and click the menu button and what we need to do is go to the wireless and it's the very first thing that's highlighted and the way we navigate around this screen is just with the scroll wheel here and one thing you need to be aware of, you can see up at the top, it's one slash two right here. That means there's two pages. So as I scroll down, it's going to go to the next page. So if you can't find something, it's probably on another page. And so let's just go right here to the very first thing and I'm just pushing the set button. So in here, this is a little bit different than the previous version. We have those menu icons and within each one, there's a number of different things. So in here, we have four different uh, things that we can choose from. Now, if we already know which channel we want to decide, we can just go into channel and set that. But let's go right away to a new feature and I'm going to scroll down to scan. What scan does is if I hit the set button here, we're gonna use our scroll wheel, go to start. And now what's happening is the controller is actually scanning your environment up to 100 meters and it's looking for the best, um, basically the best channel. So the least interference there. So it takes a few seconds, you can see the percentage going up there. And once it's done, what it's going to do is give us a list of channels that it thinks are least interference. Now it doesn't automatically choose that channel for you. So what I need to do is actually go in and choose one. So you can see our list there. That's great. I'm gonna go in and choose channel 10. So I'm just gonna click the back button here. So you see the little arrow. I can just click that to go back within my menu. It actually backs us right up, but I'll just go back in here again and go on to channel. So we decided we're gonna pick channel 10. And again, just to use my scroll wheel here, I can go either way and just go to number 10. 
So now that is set, I can get out of there by clicking the um, little arrow button here. And I'm gonna go through the rest of these later. Um, the only really one you wanna be concerned with right away is the ID. Um, you don't wanna set that in most circumstances. A lot of people end up setting this and basically it just gives you like an extra variation. We're on channel 10, but we could be on ID one to 99. And a lot of people forget to turn it off. And if you don't set your strobe to that with the ID, it's not gonna connect. So unless you really need to, you're in a place where there's multiple people shooting, then I would just leave that off. So again, I can hit this button or I can just go right out here by pushing our menu button again. Now here's the big feature of the X-Pro controllers as a general rule is that they have their groups listed down the side. So we don't actually need to go and set our group. We need to set our group on the actual light that we're going to be using. So if I was using a speed light, I would just one light, for example, I would set it to A. If I was doing multiple lights, I might have two background lights that I want to set as A. I have my main light as B and a fill light as C. So the great thing about this is that you can control uh, multiple lights per group. So those background lights, for example, if I was going to put them on A, um, they're going to adjust at the exact same power. So it's a good practice if you're going to be adjusting multiple lights that you want the same type of light on the same group. So there's no point of putting a speed light and a 600 watt strobe on the same group because they have different maximum and minimum power levels. So just be aware of that when you're setting groups. If all you're doing is just one light, you're just getting started, then all we need to do, set that channel on uh, the controller and then pick our group. And the way we pick it is we just push the button and it's going to highlight and that's how we flip to the different groups. So in our case, we're gonna be using A and now we can stop and take a look at what our strobe or our speed light is on. In this case, we're gonna use a speed light and I'll show you how to do that right now. Okay, I've grabbed a Godox V860 version three. This is the latest lithium battery speed light from Godox. And this happens to be a Nikon, but the menu features are basically all the same. So setting up a strobe is really easy. There's just a group channel button, select that um, to enable your specific channel and group. With a speed light, we have one extra step. We need to put this into receiver mode. Uh, right now, this is just the mode if we were sliding it onto the hot shoe of the camera, so it won't work to be transmitted there. So I need to hit the zigzag button over by my thumb. Once I do that, I go through commander mode, and now I'm going to be in receiver mode. If you have a previous version, um, there might be multi-mode, so just scroll through until you see RX mode, and you'll see the little wireless symbol. In previous versions, make sure you're not in optical receiver. We need to see that little wireless symbol in the top left corner. From there, we have dedicated group and channel buttons here. I can highlight it and then use my dial to select my channel. I've already done that. We've set that to 10 and we're on group A. And now we're ready to just push the test button to make sure that we're communicating. And if I do that, yep, yeah, I'm firing. I'm not sure if you guys can see that. And I can highlight my group here and I can actually just change the power as necessary. There we go. I'm holding this really close and I'm gonna discuss that in a minute here. Normally you would never be this close to the actual trigger. They do need a little bit of distance to communicate. So if you're sitting here like I am and touching it, it might not um, react properly. So always make sure you've got at least, you know, kind of six inches of distance to prevent any communication errors. Um, that's really all I wanted to show you on here. Uh, we're going to go through everything else on the actual controller, but just a quick setup. That's really all you need to do to set up a flash or a strobe. Now I could just change the modes if I want to here. So I'm in manual mode and you saw how I was adjusting the power, but I can go over here to highlight my A group here and change the modes going, that turns it off you saw there. Now I'm in TTL. I can add exposure compensation here just by the scroll wheel. So I can go plus three or minus three, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you're just looking to get going really quick, you can stop the video here. But if you wanna get in depth and see everything that this controller has to 
offer, then continue along with me. Let's talk about the modes here. So we have a highlighted and there's different ways you can highlight this. So by default, it's got the top one um, highlighted there. But if I actually wanna go in for full control, I can just hit the set button here and that's going to highlight it. Or if I didn't do that, I can still use this button up here by A and it's going to highlight it again. So once it's highlighted like that, like I just showed you with that speed light, we can adjust the power. And I'm adjusting right now in one third stops and we can adjust that in the custom functions if you wanna fine tune that. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. But manual power is really easy. So normally this would be used, set your camera to manual mode and then just adjust the power as you want. So one over one is always going to be full power. And then on the lower end, it depends on your actual light. So by default here, this goes down to one one twenty eighth. So a lot of speed lights will be there, but a lot of strobes won't be, unless you have like X-Pro, or I shouldn't say X-Pro, pro level strobes, like the 8600, 8400, those kind of strobes, they'll actually go lower. So there's a setting that we'll go in in a second and show you that. But if you're wondering why won't that go any lower, it's because we have it capped there at 1128th. So just make sure if you're putting different strobes or different speed lights on different groups that you have the maximum set, max, I shouldn't say maximum, actually minimum set for those lights. Um, so that's really all there is to adjusting manual. If we go and click the mode button here, we're going to go to that dotted line that's off. So you can turn individual groups off without actually physically turning the light off. It essentially just prevents it from being triggered. Now we're in TTL and this could also be thought of as automatic mode. It stands for through the lens and you have to have a TTL enabled speed light or strobe that does TTL. If you don't, then this function won't work, but any of the pro series strobes will and all of the speed lights, except if you pick um, like the TT 600 manual version. Um, so with TTL, we don't have the same power scale. We have exposure compensation. So I'm just gonna hit the set button. And when I bring the dial up, you're gonna see that goes plus one all the way to plus three. And on the other side, it goes all the way down to minus three. And what we can do with that, since TTL is in automatic mode, if we take a picture and the camera and the flash and the controller are basically talking to each other, trying to decide, how do we expose this picture to absolute kind of medium light levels? We don't have any highlights or shadows or highlights peaking or shadows that are getting um, underexposed. It tries, tries to neutralize everything. Sometimes that's not great because you actually want more exposure in. So that's where I would go and just dial that in, hit the set button there and just set that to plus one and kind of experiment from there. Same thing on the negative side, you would take away uh, stops of light. One thing to be aware of on the strobes that this is a cumulative effect. So if you actually go to the physical strobe or speed light and set exposure compensation on there, this adds to that exposure compensation. So just be aware if you set plus one on the actual light, you'd actually be plus two here. So I recommend just leaving the lights at zero uh, because it's very rare that you would need to have that much more control. So we have just one group highlighted, but the great thing about this is we can have multiple groups highlighted. So if I go to B here, I can set that one to a different mode as well. So I can just click the mode button here down by my thumb. I can put it on TTL, I can go to manual. Usually you're not gonna mix manual and TTL a whole lot. There's not a real use situation that I would do that. I mean, it does happen, but normally these are gonna be all the same mode when you're shooting. So let's enable three groups here. We'll do C as well and just change that one. Now, a normal use would be that these are not all going to be the same power. So you've got a key light, a fill light, and you know maybe a hair light. So let's say A is our main light. That's probably gonna have the most power. You know, we dial that in to, I don't know, one eighth, and then 
or fill is going to be less than that so you can dial that in and so you can see just how quickly and easy it is to switch between these different lights so in the past you used to have to go and walk up to an actual light i mean it's been the case with godox for a number of years obviously that you don't have to do that but you can just see how easy that is so if you have godox lights and you don't have a controller you're really missing out on the whole concept behind their system is the ability to take that off camera or to control your strobes individually or in different groups so again in these different groups you could have multiple lights in c like i mentioned before or you could just have individual ones so you're not limited to just five lights you can create a crazy setup if you want now one thing you can do you see this little all button here on the actually the all symbol it's controlled by the button directly underneath of it so if i hit that all button what it does is it highlights all of my powers there and it's going to adjust them all in sequence. So you can see they're not adjusting the same because I had them set differently before, but it's adding a third stop to all of those power settings. So if I wanted to actually level those out, I could, I could just go into B for example here, set that to half power. Let's go this way. Half power directly and same with this one just take off that now when i hit all they're all going to go the same because it's adding a third stop oh, sorry didn't highlight all there we go sorry i had to go the other way and so you can see we can adjust them just like that so if you want to adjust that really easy just use the all button if your screen starts getting cluttered and you want to just see one specific group, we can easily do that. So just highlight whatever group it is that you want on the side here. So we can click the B button there. We can actually flip between them. You don't have to use those. Once it's highlighted, I can use these two buttons, the group. It says GR up and then GR down. So I can flip between them that way as well. But what I want to do is go over to the scroll wheel. This button right here looks like a little magnifying glass. I hit that and it zooms into my B group. So I can see it just makes it bigger. I can see my zoom setting, which I'll talk about in a minute. I can see all of the details just of that group. If I want to get back out of there, I can just hit that again. You know, it's quick and easy if you are having difficulty seeing it um, with your eyesight, which I do sometimes filming these videos. That's really handy to do too, just to take a quick glance at a bigger zoom. I've disabled the other groups here just to clean the screen up a little bit so you can see easier. And I wanna talk about sync. Sync is controlled right here by this button underneath sync. And if I hit it, you're gonna see this H appear up on the top. And that is uh, displaying the H because we are now in high speed sync mode. So this controller is capable of shooting up to one eight thousandth of a second with your camera as long as you have a high speed sync enabled um, strobe or speed light. Most of them are, some of the manual ones won't be, any of the AD Pro series will be high speed sync compatible. And basically any speed light, unless it's a manual, and even some of the manuals will be. So usually all speed lights will have high speed sync. And that just allows you to over sync uh, on top of your camera's native shutter. Most are capped at like 1 to 50th or 1 to 100th of a second. This allows you to go to the, all the way to 1 8,000th and that's going to help you freeze motion, control ambient light. Uh, it's a really useful tool. One thing I wanna mention about high speed sync though is on the controller, even though we can go down below 1 16th there, your actual light will not go below 1 16th when you're in high speed sync. That is a cap on pretty much every Godox light, I believe. So just be aware if you're dialing that uh, below and then all of a sudden you're seeing on your light, why isn't it going any further down? It's because there's not enough light to produce to give you a high speed sync effect. Essentially, you're just gonna have a blank frame. So you need to have enough light that it's actually going to expose with high speed sync. Um, I should mention we are using a Nikon controller here. So this is different in Canon and some of the other brands. 
where when we go through the sink, if we actually pushed this again, we would see three little arrows show up just beside there. And that's indicating rear curtain sink. Now Nikon is capable of that as well, except it's accessed through the camera menu. The other, can, uh, the other brands, I should say, you can do it right through here by just pushing sync and it's gonna scroll through there. So just be aware of that. There's nothing wrong with your controller. These all operate a little bit differently. So if there's something I'm saying here that's not exactly the same on Canon or Sony or Leica or something, don't worry. They basically all have you know, basically the same features. They can just be accessed a different way. So that's sync. Let's uh, talk about zoom here. We're going to talk about zoom now and I enable that by just hitting the button under zoom. And I'll try to hold this speed light as still as possible in the light. Um, most strobes do not have zoom. This is primarily a speed light feature with the exception right now of the AD100 Pro, which actually does have a zoom. So normally this is just with a speed light. And what zoom does is it controls the diaphragm opening and closing in uh, the front. So the lens is opening and closing. I'll just highlight this to show you real quick. So I'm not sure if you could pick that up, but as I go to 200, it closes down. And then as I go to the other side, which is on the wider, it's opening up to try to shoot that light as wide as possible. Now to enable that, just highlight your group here. It's really easy to do. One thing I should mention, if your speed light is completely vertical, you actually need to turn that down to enable that. So now it knows you're not trying to just bounce that into the ceiling. Um, highlight my group, it was highlighted actually, and just adjust. So 24 mil is the widest, and then 200 is the narrowest. Now I should mention on here, if we happen to pull out the wide angle diffuser, that will actually default back to 14 millimeters. So if you're ever wondering, why is my speed light not zooming? So here I can't adjust anything, it's just stuck at 14. It's because we have this wide angle out, so make sure that gets pushed all the way in, it clicks in. You can probably hear it there. Now we're back on track. We can adjust that as necessary. So you can go through each individual speed light if you have it enabled. Uh, if you're not using speed lights, then the zoom function really doesn't matter. So to get back out of that, we can just hit the arrow button back and we're out of zoom and there you have it. Next on the main screen, we have this little light bulb which indicates our modeling lamp. Now, pretty much every strobe will have a modeling lamp uh, with the exception of a few. Uh, most speed lights won't except some of the new ones as well from Godox. They're starting to put it on like the V860 I was just showing you. So for the modeling lamp, we can just hit that and you're gonna see it enables for all of the groups there. Now, we don't have the other ones turned on so it doesn't really matter. But now we can go in each individually and we can change the different modes. In the previous version, it just used to be you could only turn it on. But now, if we go in here and we hit the modeling lamp, I can go proportional, which just means as I bring the power of my strobe up or down, the modeling lamp goes with it, which is really nice. Or I can have it completely off or I can set an actual percentage. So if I wanna go in there and set that percentage, there's nothing I can do right here with the dial. I actually have to go hold that button, that's the modeling lamp button I'm talking about for like two seconds until it highlights. And now I can adjust that as necessary. So I should mention that this feature does not work on every model of strobe that has a modeling lamp. So mainly it's going to work on anything that's newer. So AD series, so the Pro series, some of the new QT series, um, all of them will be able to turn on or off no matter which version you have, but this individual control is going to be limited to specific models. So as new lights are released, they will all have that ability. So if you're wondering why yours doesn't have like a percentage control, it's because your strobe isn't going to support that quite yet. And I should also mention that before you do anything, you should actually update any of your AD Pro series lights. They need an update to use the X-Pro2 controller and all of its features. It'll still 
fire um, all the time, but some of the internal menu features and this modeling lamp feature won't actually work until you update. So that's everything on the main screen. To turn that off again, I can just click the modeling lamp and that'll turn it off for all of the groups. So if you just want them all on quickly, just go ahead and do that. Um, holding it doesn't do anything there. You need to go and individually change each one. But for now, we'll turn that off and move on. We have another mode now that is actually hidden. We want to make sure that a group is not highlighted. It won't work if the group is fully highlighted. So nothing's highlighted. And then I go and push the mode button again, and that is going to enter multi-mode. Now, please don't confuse this with continuous high shooting on your camera where you're going to burst off 40 frames a second. This is used uh, one frame to capture a sequence of movement. So for example, a dancer on a black backdrop uh, on the stage, and you want to capture that sequence of the move where she's moving across the stage and completing it. That's where you use multi. So this is actually a whole different mode here, and you can see on the side, A says on. We have to enable each group that we want multi to turn on. We can't control the actual power levels and everything individually. All we can do is turn those individual groups on and off. So if I want to turn on group C, for example, let's say it's a side light I need on, I'm going to highlight it, and then I'm going to hit the mode button, and that's going to turn it either on or off. So same thing, just go to whatever groups you want. It's really easy enable them on and off. So we're just going to have A on right now. And if I hit set, it just unhighlights that. But what we need to do is actually set our power levels here so we can set our time. So that's the number of times the flash is going to fire and the number of hertz, which is essentially the power level of, or the frequency of that stroke. So times just highlight it down here in the left. And that's saying that we want 10 shots, then highlight hertz at 9 hertz. And so when you hit the test button, it's going to blast off that light in a sequence. You're going to hit it once, and then it just fires multiple shots. So be aware that this is going to be most effective at lower power if you want the maximum number of shots that you can get. Because as we go to higher power levels, your actual strobe or speed light is not going to recycle near as fast if you select a power level of, say, half. Obviously, 1 one twenty-eighth, you're going to get a lot more shots out of that. So you can see, actually, in the manual, and we have um, separate information on this where you can actually link up the shutter speed that you're setting and the number of times that you're firing at the certain amount of hertz. There's a chart that you can take a look at that. But I just wanted to go over that quickly for you so you can see what it is. If you get stuck in it, just be aware that if I hit this, I'm going to go back out and turn it off. So if I'm stuck and I'm like, why can't I get into multi-mode? It's just switching, unhighlight, push the mode button, and now we're in multi. And you can see it indicated up there on the top as well. So there you have multi-mode. Okay, we've gone through all of the modes and menus. Now it's time to get into custom functions, everyone's favorite part here. So what we're going to do is hit the menu. And right away, like before I mentioned, we have a whole new interface in the X-Pro version 2 where Godox is using this set of icons. I'm still not sure whether I like that or not. You kind of need to familiarize yourself with what those icons mean. Otherwise, you're going to be left wondering. We're going to start at the beginning and go through them all. Please note that we are on version 1.0 of this. So you might be watching this a few years down the road. We could be on version 2, and there could be a bunch more icons and a number of features. Godox changes these all the time from feedback that we give them, that we receive from you guys. And the nice thing is now um, that we have a platform that we can upgrade with all of the current mirrorless cameras in the past on the version one, we're starting to get to a point where we were running out of the hardware capacity to make some of these changes. So um, that's one of the benefits of upgrading to the X-Pro2. You should be good for another six years here. So in the wireless mode, we have our channel, which we talked about before already. We have our ID, so if you needed another sequence of IDs to separate your channel even further, you can do that 
from 1 to 99, and I'm just accessing these. I would hit the set button to enter them, use the scroll wheel. Again, be careful in ID if you do that. Um, you're going to come out of sync with your strobe if you forget to set the ID on that. But hit the back button here, and it unfortunately pulls you all the way back there, which is actually really annoying. Uh, we have our scan, which we talked about. And we have our distance here, and this is an important one. You can see that I'm on zero to 30. By default, this is actually set one to 100. If you're gonna be using this really close, you saw earlier when I was demonstrating the speed light, like right here, that I was having communication issues. You need to change this zero to 30 if you're having any kind of wireless interference, if you've already checked the channels and that didn't fix it. Change your distance from zero to 30. This goes all the way uh, out to one to 100 is like 300 feet. Most of the time you're not gonna need that. So if you're in a studio, I recommend just leaving it zero to 30. One of the other things that is actually a bit tricky here is that there's pages on here now. So it shows up on the top one to two. So it's easy to forget about what's on the next page. And that would be groups in this menu. So we have our groups um, right now set five groups, uh, A to E. You can actually set multiple groups, like 16 groups now. So if we go in there, set 16 groups, and I'm just gonna exit out of the menu here. Um, what we can do is just highlight that actually, and now we can go past E, F, and then we go zero, one, two. So this is also a new feature on this. You couldn't do this before. It's pretty rare that you're gonna need that many groups, but if you do, you can expand past those, um, past the standard five that you get. So again, most people, I wouldn't recommend doing that. It's just gonna confuse you. You might have a light set way down in a group somewhere that you forgot about. So just keep that here unless you're a person that really needs that. Okay, so unfortunately we have to use that back button and it takes us back to the menu there. Now we have Bluetooth. So this is another new feature in the X Pro 2. If we go into Bluetooth, we have two different things. We can turn Bluetooth on or off. And so the reason why you would turn this on is if you're using the app and we'll have a separate video for this. So you can actually use the app on your phone to control all your lights. It creates a communication link between your controller. So you could have, for example, if you had a shooting assistant and you could just be telling them, uh, change the main light down two stops or something. So they could do that from the phone rather than coming to your controller that you're shooting with. So it's really nice if you've got an assistant that you can use that app. So we just have our on or off. And I should mention that if you are connecting to it, the password is always six zeros. So it's gonna ask you for a password. So just put in a bunch of zeros there, but we'll have a separate video on the new Godox app. If you need to reset the Bluetooth, which can happen sometimes, we just go to reset and you can click reset and be back to default in no time on the Bluetooth. That just helps for connecting. Next, we have our multi-control, and I didn't mention this before, but remember how we were in the menu here, and if I don't have anything highlighted, I can hit this and go into multi. Sometimes that can be annoying because you forget to highlight and then you're putting yourself into multi mode. If you want a way to disable that, go into multi, turn multi to off. So now, when I go in and I hit this, nothing happens. We've disabled that button. And for most of you, I would actually probably turn that on. It's pretty rare you're gonna be using multi anyway. So that just disables that button so you don't accidentally go into it each time. Uh, next, we have a triggering delay here so we can set the milliseconds on here. Now, if you don't know what this is, don't mess with it because if you set any kind of delay, your flash and your shutter are gonna be out of sync but sometimes with older triggers or remote shutter releases, you need to add a delay into that. So that's where it can be done right here. You just scroll through and you can add the number of milliseconds that you need. We'll get back out of there and we're going to go into step. 
So step is something that you're going to use. I talked before about the minimum power levels of different strobes. Sometimes they're 1128, sometimes they're uh, 1256. So basically the Godox Pro series uses 1256. So I would go over here to 1256 and I can decide, highlight it, sorry. Highlight which one that I want to use. So 256 I could use, let me just go back up here. I can use in third stops. So if you're wondering what all these numbers are, I have third stops in 1128, 1256, and 1512. If I want to go to tenth increments, I can do that. That's the 0 0.1 here. So set that to wherever I want. And then you can just choose on the bottom here as well. If you don't want the power scale, you can set um, down here, three would be top power or two, so or one even. Godox is just really giving you a lot of options in there. I would recommend most of you, if you're using a Pro Series, set it to 1256, and then just be aware that if you're using a light that doesn't go that far, that you're not going to be able to turn that any lower. So now I'm at 256, so it goes all the way down. So you're able to use really precise control with Godox here. And you saw that actual uh, 512 there. That's for Godox's most powerful lights. That's the uh, P2400, for example, and possibly coming on other lights in the future. Next, we're going into shoot mode. And by default, uh, we are in single shooter, and that's the majority of people where they're going to shoot. If you find yourself in a situation where you're at an event and you have multiple shooters, trying to control the same lights, then you want to go into multi-mode. With multi-mode, essentially what's going to happen is if you each have a trigger, then you're going to have your updated power settings sent to the strobe all the time. So the problem would be, say, if I had my trigger at full power and someone else had their trigger at half power, whose is in charge? With multi-mode, uh, each person shooting at that time is going to send that power level to the strobe. The downfall with that is that it uses twice as much power uh, because there's constantly signals being sent back and forth. So just be aware of that. Bring some extra batteries because it will chew through them a lot quicker. The last mode here, you can see the L858. Whoops, go back into it. This is brand new for this uh, X-Pro2, and this is a collaboration that Godox has with Sakonic. And right now it's only specifically with the 858, which is unfortunate because this is a very expensive light meter. But what it enables you to do is you can actually, you have to have the Godox module in that light meter as well, but you can actually control your lights and fire your lights right from the light meter. So if you're someone working in a professional studio where that's going to save you a lot of time or you have an assistant doing it for you, then this is maybe something you want to consider. But essentially, you have to purchase that separately. Make sure you get the Godox module and you can adjust everything right from that Sakonic, which is a really neat feature. Maybe in the future, they'll release it for some lower end light meters, but right now it's just for the 858. So if you're using that, make sure you go to that mode. Otherwise, we're just going back to single and we can move on from there. Let's take a look at TCM. This is kind of a unique feature on the X-Pro. Uh, it differs from the X2T, which doesn't have it. What this enables you to do is actually take a photo in TTL mode and convert that power level because we don't know what TTL, what power uh, level it's at. We can hit the button and then we can actually convert that to a manual measurement. So if you want a way to see what your TTL power levels are, this is the way to do it. So let's go in, if we select that, inside here you're going to see a symbol here which is for speed lights. Then we have this, it's the 8100 Pro, the 8200 Pro, etc. And these are all the Pro level strobes. So this function is not available for strobes that don't have TTL, and it actually won't work on old model um, speed lights as well. So what you would do, depending on what light you're trying to test this on, so ideally they would all be the same lights, but let's just say we're testing this on an 8600 Pro. I would go in here, to the 600J, click set, 
And now what I would do is go back out. So with TTL enabled on our group, I would take the photo. And then as soon as I take the photo, what I'm going to do is highlight my group. I can do that by pushing the button or hitting the set button and change the mode. And so all of a sudden what's going to happen is whatever was on manual, it doesn't matter. It's going to change and it's going to tell you now on this manual group uh, what that power level was. So it could be essentially anything from TTL. As soon as you look here, now we know, okay, it's 132nd. Now I can go and manually set all my power levels if I want. Now, honestly, this is not something that's used a lot of the time, but if you're curious what that power level was, then you can just use the TCM function. But normally, uh, leave that disabled, because if you do go to TTL then, um, it's going to be converting that for you when you switch modes, so we'll leave that off. Next, we're going to our single pin firing mode, and they call this legacy hot shoe. So essentially what this does uh, is disable TTL and high speed sync on this. And the way that it does it is it essentially makes the rest of the pins on the bottom dummy pins and only fires the center pin. So this would be useful in a couple different situations. So if you had some really old, um, like an old camera or something, or let's even say you had a, a Sony body, but only a Nikon trigger, you could disable high speed sync and TTL and just fire the single pin and it's still going to fire a Nikon controller on that Sony camera, for example. Uh, the other reason that you would do this is if you're trying to do high speed shooting, if you're trying to maximize the number of frames per second that you can shoot, then what this does is it slows down that pro or it speeds up that processing time because you don't have TTL and high speed sync that it has to make the calculations for. All it's doing is just sending the fire signal to the light each time, passes it through the camera much quicker so you can achieve faster burst rates. So if that's something you're doing, you're trying to uh, get something, you know, in 10 frames a second, something like that, you're probably not gonna hit all of those frames, but this will improve your chances on doing that. Otherwise, definitely make sure that you leave this off. Otherwise, you're gonna be wondering why you don't have TTL or high-speed sync. Next, we have the test fire control button indicated by the lightning bolt there. And you are going to leave this on trigger unless you have purchased separately an XR receiver. You can get those for Canon, Nikon, or Sony, and you would use that to remotely fire the shutter of your camera. So by default, when I push this button in, it's just going to fire the lights. If I change it here to shutter, you're going to see that change. So if I half push this test fire button, it's green and then goes red. So I would be focusing the camera and then firing it right there. So in contrast, if I just go in and leave it on trigger, that button, every time I push it, whether it's halfway or all the way, is just going to fire immediately. So that's something to pay attention to. Leave that on trigger unless you're using it for remote shutter firing. So we'll leave that here. And like I said before, we have a second page here. So rotate through. On PC, we can change the input to in or out. So that's just controlling the signal. Normally you're gonna leave that as in. We'll move on. And that just has to do with the PC sync cable that's plugged in here, this port over here. This one uh, turns the beep on or off of your lights. So if you don't want that recycling beep, you can switch it on or off. Next is the sleep mode of the controller. So you can set this to off, which means it won't uh, go into standby mode, or you can go 60 minutes, 30 minutes, or 60 seconds. Probably I would leave this on 60 seconds, which is the default. So that will just turn it off. Some cameras you can wake it up with the, by focusing other uh, cameras, you're actually gonna have to hit the set button or the test fire button. So just be aware of that if the screen turns off. That's probably what happened. Your batteries aren't actually dead. Okay, the next feature we want to look at is light. If I hit the set button. Now this is the backlight on the display. So right now I have it set to on because we're shooting this video. I don't want it going on and off. 
Uh, normally you would just leave it on 12 seconds. So after 12 seconds, it will turn off and go to the unlit screen. Or if you want, you can just turn it off completely, but I like leaving it on the 12 seconds. Next, we have our contrast, and Godox is famous for this doing nothing on absolutely any of their LCD screens. So you can see as I scroll through, maybe it gets a bit dimmer, but it's really not that much. So leaving it at zero or kind of plus one is fine to set it there. Uh, next is user, and this is a new feature, which is kind of cool, um, not available on any other controller. So when I go into here, what I can do is save all of my settings. So let's just do a quick example. We'll get out into the menu here. So I have a manual. Let's set this one to TTL and this one to TTL as well. So if I go into user, I can save that to one of five different groups. So let's save that to number three. So if I had um, two different ways you could use this actually, if I had different setups in my studio and I wanted those settings saved for each of the lights, I can do that. Or if I had multiple users that were using this controller, I could save each profile to a number there. So we'll save that to number three. And I'm just going to go back here and I'm going to turn these all or just turn a couple off here so you can see. Now, if this works properly, we hit the menu, go to user and we want to load profile number three. So it's loading it. Now we can go back in and we saw that it just brought back all of our stuff that we had saved onto that user. So that's actually really cool. Um, a new feature in here that you can use if you want to. Uh, next, we are on to clear. And this is going to clear all of the settings in here. So it'll reset them all back to default. And you can do this without uh, resetting the entire controller. So if I want to do a hard reset of the controller, I go to RST here. And let's just get out. If I hold these two together, what's going to happen? Oops, you need to push them kind of at the same time. Hold for three seconds, reset, and just go to OK, and that's going to reset the whole thing. So that's actually kind of handy sometimes. We get people that have like enabled a bunch of stuff. They don't know what they're doing anymore. Something's not triggering, or the controller's not triggering the light anymore. So start there, just do a hard reset, start over, because the fact of the matter is like, depend, despite everything I've told you guys, that seems really complicated. All you need to do on this is set a group and a channel and set a group and a channel. And then all we can do is just change our power levels. We can change our mode. That's really all there is to this controller. It's actually really simple. That brings us to the end of the custom functions and you guys have stuck with me the whole time. Hopefully this has been informative to you. Um, this is by far more information than you're gonna find in the manual that really doesn't explain any of these features. And I do just wanna point out again that this is just the initial firmware. Um, so more things will be added. We see we have more icons and more features can be changed. So everything might not be in the same position at release date as it is a year from now. So whenever you're watching this, um, we will continue to update these um, with pinned comments there so you can check those out. But as always, if you have any questions, you're stuck on something, feel free to reach out to us in the comments here or contact us at the store. So there you have it. That's everything you need to know about the Godox X-Pro version two radio controller from Godox. If you want the latest and greatest that Godox has to offer in controller technology, then this is the one that you want to pick up. If you don't need the big screen and all these features, then the X2T is also a great option. So be sure to check out all the different brands that we have. So Canon, Nikon, Sony, Pentax, Olympus, Panasonic, and even Leica now for this controller. Be sure to pick the right one so it works with your camera. And until next time, I'm Jesse at Stropro.com and enjoy creating.